everyone. Uh, my name is Hamza. I'm going to be doing the hosting and uh, monitoring the Q&A. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them in the chat window. So first, I'd like to thank everyone for signing in this event. Today, we're joined by Brian, with, with, with Daniel Bryant. He's the director of DevRail and at the Ambassador Labs. His technical expertise focuses on DevOps tooling, uh, cloud uh, container platforms, and microservice implementations. Daniel is a Java champion and uh, contributes to several open source projects. He also writes for InfoQ, OAD, and uh, the new stack, and uh, regularly presents at international conferences, such as uh, KubeCon and KubeCon and uh, JavaCon. Okay, well, uh, now I'll hand it over to you, Daniel. You can present uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Hamza. I really appreciate you uh, hosting tonight. And that intro was awesome. I promise I will only get like downhill from here, right? <laughs> With these big, exciting <laughs> intros, I'm like, please, please don't, don't expect too much. Here we go, folks. Yeah. I appreciate everyone turning up. There is this great crowd here. I know we're all virtual at the moment, but I really do appreciate everyone spending their evening or their afternoon with me. So here we go. Let me move my Zoom around a little bit and we'll go to that. Sorry, everyone. Uh, we all look good. Everyone see my screen okay? Brilliant, here we go. So yes, easy debugging of Java microservices running on Kubernetes with CNCF project telepresence. Oh, press play. There we go. So the TLDR is that the inner development loop, apologies, I set my screen up correctly. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, I've lost my mouse. Here we go. Sorry, apologies. Um, so the inner development loop can be painful with Java microservices and Kubernetes. That is, I know I'm, I love Java, I've been coding in it in many years. Um, Java can be quite memory intensive. So if you only got a laptop with say eight, 16 gigs or whatever, you can only run a few services locally. And as you start getting bigger and bigger applications, that, that fast in a dev loop where you want to code something, see the results, maybe it's dependent on another service, that loop can slow down. This is a big problem. Keep losing my mouse, sorry. Uh, so telepresence at all proxies your local machine into the cluster and you get that fast feedback loop. That, that's, you know, throughout my career, I remember back in the day doing a lot of Java monolith work and we were doing hot, uh, hot reload using tools like zero turnaround, things like that. Telepresence kind of points in that direction, getting that fast feedback for code, for testing, seeing the results. Oh, sorry, everyone. Telepresence support with several workflows. So I'll give you a live demo, then run through some of the ways you can use it as well. And happy to take some questions at the end. Hamza and I've chatted. Any sort of emergency questions of me doing something completely wrong along the way, feel free to put into the Q&A and Hamza will reach out to me, but then we'll take some questions at the end too. This is a CNCF, a Cloud Native Computing Foundation project. So it's open source. We love folks getting involved. I'll give you some guidelines on how you can do that at the end, but yeah. Part of the reason I do these talks, you know, we do steward the project, Ambassador Labs, the company I work for, we do steward the tele telepresence project, but it's a community project. So folks like yourself are super, super helpful, super valuable. We'd love you to get involved. Right, very quickly, this is me at Daniel Bryant UK on most of the interwebs, Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn, love to get involved folks, particularly on Twitter. And my background is Java development, move through to software architecture, ops, kind of now more DevRel stuff. I've written a couple of books, or I've written one book in particular, Continuous Delivery in Java, writing another one currently, Mastering API Architecture. Just worth pointing out that my co-authors on all these books are from the LJC. I met Abraham through the LJC. We presented together. We went on and wrote a book together. Fantastic. Jim and Matthew, or Matt, on the second book I'm writing, Mastering API Architecture, again, met them in the OJC. Jim, in particular, done a lot of fantastic work on the Java DateTime API back in the day, Java 8 time. Um, so the OJC, for me, has been a massive inflection point in my career. I've met some amazing people, open doors, written books, work together, love it. So the OJC is a fond place in my heart, and, and the RetWorks team, too. Right, setting the scene. So the inner and outer dev loop is critical to our workflow, right? And I've borrowed this from a gent called Mitch Denny, and unfortunately the blog post has disappeared because it was a fantastic blog post, um, but I've managed to find some graphics that sort of capture the spirit of it. Uh, hopefully you'll all recognize this, uh, whether you're an architect, a developer, QA, whatever role you do, there's that inner dev loop where you're often unit testing, maybe a bit of dependencies going on, but you're optimizing for that fast feedback loop. I've got an idea, Maybe I'll write a test first, does it work? Maybe I do some code, we test it. Very fast, very fast. 
Once we're happy, we will then push to what's called the outer loop. And that's where typically your Jenkins takes over, your Circle CI, you're building an artifact, you're deploying, you're you know, maybe running some in-memory tests, these kind of things too. If you're building containers, well, the outer loop, you typically would build a container and deploy into something like Kubernetes. Now the snag, I'll just run through that. The snag with Kubernetes is your inner and outer loop is often quite the same, right? You write some code, you build your container, you push it to a registry. If you're doing, say, deployment on Amazon or um, Google G GKE, that kind of thing, you deploy it to that cluster, and then you run some tests. And often, if you've got microservice systems that are quite highly coupled, now you always strive for you know minimal coupling, high cohesion, loose coupling. But inevitably, as we're building stuff, you want to test stuff that's running as another service. So if you, you know if you have to build the container, push it up into the cluster to test it this inner loop is very slow, right? This is a bit, bit of a blocker if you're trying to iterate very fast. Automation can help. There is a fantastic gamut of open source tools out there. Scaffold, uh, fantastic by the Google folks, automates a lot of the build of the container and the pushing up to registry behind the scenes. You can sync file systems, do port, uh, port forwarding, very cool tool. Garden, similar vein. Gitcube, uh, I haven't used that one for a while now, but I, I, when I initially put this presentation together, it was quite popular actually. I, a dra a draft has fallen beside the wayside. Microsoft are no longer committing to this project anymore. So don't, don't really, I wouldn't look at draft, draft to be honest. It was interesting sort of back uh, six months ago, a year ago when I was putting this presentation initially together. Octeto has popped up in a similar space here. They do a lot of automation around syncing your local file system, your local development loop to a remote Kubernetes cluster. They do a kind of namespace as a service and also Tilt. I'm loving the Tilt folks, regularly chat to the, well, just I regularly chat to folks from all these communities, but Tilt and Garden in particular, and the Scaffold folks we chat to quite a lot. A lot of these are still focused on building containers behind the scenes. And sometimes you just want that super fast dev loop, right? You don't want the Docker build, you don't want the Docker push. And you also want to use your own tools. Like in particular, like remote debugging for me has just been, you know, I've been coding Java 20 years and it's definitely got better, but setting up remote debugging is just hard, right? You know, IntelliJ idea makes, makes it fantastic. VS Code got some really cool tools there as well, but opening the ports correctly, particularly if you're in Kubernetes, you have to make sure you've got your port mappings correct, you've got your firewall rules set correctly. Like I just want to run my, you know, IntelliJ debugger and I don't want to be messing around with this remote debugging stuff. So I want to use my own tools like sort of a lo local type experience. The, the sort of temptation, particularly when you get to this point or when you're starting, you want to run everything locally. So you spin up your services in Docker, your mini cube, micro Kates, K3S, take your pick. This works very well for a few services, yeah? And if you're developing in something super lightweight, like Go, where you can build a binary, and um, this actually can go, can take you quite far. You can be building quite a lot of services. But if you're running Java, this may be a familiar thing. Particularly on my, my 16 inch Mac here, it's constantly, the fans are cutting in. You know, it, it's got a fair chunk of RAM, but when I start spinning up lots of Java processes in my mini cube, the poor laptop just can't keep up. So I'm trying to run everything locally to get that super fast feedback loop, but it's just, it's just not happening. This is where telepresence helps. Telepresence is basically a, a sort of proxies your local machine into the remote cluster. So you can run all your services in a remote cluster, it can be perhaps a shared cluster, you know, good chunk of uh, resources, good chunk of CPU and RAM, run all your services up there. Telepresence will effectively proxy your laptop into that cluster so you can debug locally using all your favorite tools, but as if you were in the cluster. That's the magic with telepresence. So Telepresence has been called a number of things. Fancy Kubernetes VPN for development. So if you're familiar with VPNs, it is kind of similar to that. KubeCuttle port forward. I'm sure many of you played around with KubeCuttle port forward, but it's fiddly, right? You have to get your pods, get your pod name, KubeCuttle port forward. What's the syntax for the ports again? You know, port, KubeCuttle port forward is an amazing tool, but Telepresence makes it sort of easier to use and it's a bunch of other stuff on top of the, the functionality provided by KubeCuttle port forward too. It's effectively a network bridge between your laptop and Kubernetes cluster. You can call services in your remote cluster and interact with them as if you were local. So you can curl the name of your service, you can do NS lookup on the name of your service. Really, really useful. 
just to set the scene, this is the app I'm going to be demoing in a minute. Super simple. I've literally got an Ingress, a very large Java service. Kind of think of it as like a, it's, it's actually a quite a simple Spring app, but think of it as like a big monolithic Java service that you're working on. Um, it's then calling out to this new service we're creating, the data processing service, data processing node service, which in turn is calling into a very large old clunky data store. Again, the very large data store is actually a Spring app that I've created, but I'm trying to sort of simulate that. Imagine you cannot run these three services, the very large Java service, data processing service, and very large data store. You can't run them on your laptop, right? You really want to work on this data processing node service, but to test it, you want to call it by the ingress. You want to call it as a user would. And the data processing node service, to do its job, needs to call out to the very large data store. So how do we do this? So Telepresence, what Telepresence does is it puts two components into your cluster. It puts a traffic manager, which kind of opens a tunnel into your cluster, manages connections from your local laptop into, into the cluster. And it also puts a sidecar service, actually an Envoy proxy for folks familiar in the space. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're not familiar with it, but it puts an Envoy proxy as a sidecar next to your container in, in your pod, and it reroutes traffic to your local machine. So we can selectively or, or globally or selectively route traffic that is destined for the remote cluster to my local machine. My local machine can make calls into the cluster, do its thing, and then I can send the response back to the ingress. So it's like my laptop is actually in the cluster. And I think I've got a demo here. Yes, yeah, so imagine a request comes in, hits my proxy, goes down to my local machine. I can then call into the very large data store and return the data. The data processing node service is still running in the remote cluster. It's just that my intercept, my, uh, my proxy here is rerouting traffic, intercepting, we say, intercepting traffic that is destined for that remote service to my local machine. And this is demo time, right? This is where I always get super nervous, like doing this for years, but still the live demos are, are fraught with danger. So let's, 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 see, let's see how we go. So I've got here a Kubernetes cluster. I'm actually running it on the Ambassador Labs infrastructure. So it's using K3S under the hood, but it's a remote cluster. You can see I've got, let me just clear my terminal. I'll just do K get service. I'll show all namespaces actually just for sake of interest. Um, you can see here I'm running um, Ambassador as an ingress. So don't worry too much about that, but I've installed Ambassador as an ingress. Uh, we actually just yesterday we've released uh, to the CNCF. Emissary Ingress. So Ambassador is being rebranded as Emissary Ingress, and it's now CNCF Project 2, breaking news on that one. Um, but I'm using the Edge Stack version, our, our community version of uh, the Emissary Ingress as, a, as an Ingress controller. And I've got my very large Java service, my very large data store, and my data processing node service I talked about uh, just a minute ago. And I can make it even uh, simpler just to do the default namespace. You can literally see I've got my um, three services here. I have in my browser, this is the, let's just move this along a bit. Um, this is my ingress that's talking into my remote cluster. So if I just refresh, you can see here, if I do, um, uh, let me just see on the ambassador, we've got our, this is our IP address of our ambassador running in the cluster. If I just do a ping, just to prove there is no tricks here, a ping of, that and control C, you'll see when I ping that domain name, it's actually pinging that IP address, which maps to our cluster. So this, what you see in the browser here, this page is being rendered by our three services in our Kubernetes cluster. And it's a little bit sort of meta here, but you can actually see the page it's rendering in my browser shows the architecture. So I'm refreshing, the, I'm hitting this page, the very large Java service is using Timeleaf under the hood to render an HTML web page. But the data it's getting, such as the 99 billion database records in the cloud environment, and also the color of my title and color of my service box here, that is all coming ultimately from the very large data store. So my very large Java service is calling into a data processing service. That in turn is calling into the very large data store. The results are coming back. The very large Java service is rendering, rendering this HTML page and showing me here what's going on. So far, so good, right? So let's fire up Telepresence. I'll clear my screen here. Just do Telepresence connect. It's asking for my pseudo password because it does some IP tables magic under the hood. This now is installing the traffic manager into my remote cluster. 
So it'll take a minute or two just to spin this up. And once we've done that, if I just do K get deployments and do A, you'll actually see the, uh, where is it? Uh, traffic manager, here we go. The Bastard, under the Bastard namespace, traffic manager has been installed. We're all good to go. Now it's as if my laptop is in the cluster. So I know, for example, I've got my very large data store. It's a Java app running on port 8080. It's in the default namespace. So I'll do 8080, and I know there's, I think it's a season's endpoint. So if I just curl this, ah, voila. So you imagine now I'm actually curling into the Kubernetes cluster and I'm using the service name. No port forward. I didn't have to do kubectl port forward onto the onto the pod, any magic kind of like that. I can literally say service name, namespace, and then what port it's running on. And then if I know the endpoints, I can hit up the endpoints. So it's already as if my laptop is connected into this cluster, which is super useful in itself. You can do NS lookup on services. You can debug DNS stuff. You can just do curls to explore, you know, explore and, and just diagnose issues and things. Super interesting. The next thing, though, is to do the intercept. This way it gets even more interesting. So let me just check. I've got IntelliJ fired up here. This is a local copy of my data processing service. What you saw here is green. This is the, the code. So let me run this locally. I'll run it in debug mode because that'll be just nicer for some stuff I'll show you later on. But no, no tricks here. It's literally just an IntelliJ IDE, IDE, sorry, running my Spring app. All looks good. So what I'll do now is I'll clear the screen again. I'll do telepresence list just to get a feel of what services I can intercept in my cluster where I can reroute traffic. So I can see the data processing service. I know it's running on port 3000 just because um, from when I did the KGET um, service, you can see port 3000 data processing service. So I will now do telepresence intercept data processing service port 3000. That will then now put a proxy next to my data processing service in the remote cluster. And that proxy will be rerouting traffic to my local machine and will be hitting our app all being well that I've got running here. All looks good. I'll, I'll go through some more details in a minute, but you can see the intercepts created, it's active, it's targeting my local host on port 3000. We'll look at the volume mounts and the TCP connections in a minute, but basically it's forwarding all the TCP connections to my local machine. So now I'll, I'll just leave this here actually uh, just so you can see in the background my app running. Notice it's a green, um, green page. I'm going to hit refresh now and watch for the change. It's, got, it's gone to blue. And the, the sort of observant among you may have noticed as I, there was, some, there was a, a legal reflection, ignore that, it's just a spring thing. But as I am hitting refresh, traffic now is being rerouted to my local machine. You can actually see the record entry here, the, the debug information spitting up. So I'm literally calling into the ingress, hitting the very large Java service, traffic to the data processing service is routed to my local machine. My local machine is calling back into the cluster, getting some data from the very large data store, passing it back through, and now we're rendering it in this page. And the reason the page is blue is because in my application properties, I've specified the color as, as blue there. I could specify it as something else and it would, it would change. And that is actually the, the powerful thing, right? If I now go into the data processing controller, if I just put a breakpoint on my, um, my color endpoint for in the data processing service, hit refresh, breakpoints triggered, all you, all you stuff you know and love, right? You can you know, watch things, you can look through the stack trace, look through the, the call graph. I can even go in, for example, here, go ooh, view edit text, we'll hit up orange. There's a, about four or five colors that I support in the back end. We'll set that, we'll pass it back in. Ah, voila. Imagine super fast feedback loop, right? I'm literally, I'm in debug mode here. I don't have to be in debug mode. I could just be coding away. I can be hitting refresh. Traffic is going from the remote cluster to my local machine. I'm calling out into the cluster, sending it back. Super fast feedback loop, all right? Let me just check my notes there. A couple of things I always like to mention to folks. Um, so if I now do telepresence leave, the data processing service. So I'll now leave that intercept. That's closed that down. If I hit refresh now, we should go back to green. We're no longer intercepting traffic. There's a few cool things you can do just depending on your use case. We can set up an intercept 
And this is exactly what I typed in before, telepresence intercept data processing service port 3000, but I'm specifying, specifying an M file now. Now, a lot of folks use environment variables in their pods um, to configure service discovery or a bunch of other stuff. And telepresence allows you to get that. So now if I just do an LL here, you can see I've got my myends text, which I've generated by the intercept. If I just do, if I load this into less, you can actually see this is your standard kind of Kubernetes environment variables, but you can plug this into IntelliJ if you're debugging, for example, and you're dependent on an environment variable that's in the cluster via the M file plugin. So you just go to the IntelliJ plugins and you can download it there. I think the config is set up here. If I do edit configurations, yeah, there's the M file tab there. You enable M file and then you just specify the location of that M file I've, I've set up there. So that's some of the little bonus one I definitely want to flag. I've covered all of this in a blog post, which I'll share in the slides at the end. So you can, you know, if I'm going a bit too fast, you can um, do this all at your own pace based on the um, based on the blog post. One other thing that you did see, and apologies, I've, I've literally broken this today, but all the volume mounts you've got in your remote pod are available locally. So if this, I don't think it's working. If I was to do an LS on this, yeah, I, I busted something with Mac views. I did a brew update and, and broke a lot of stuff that will teach me. But um, telepresence allows you to mount locally using um, on the Mac, it's Mac views and SSHFS. Uh, if you're on Linux, slightly different. But you can basically um, sync up your local, um, the local directory here to your remote uh, uh, volume mounts. So if, you're, if you've got some configs, some certificates perhaps, a common use case is to put certificates in, in a volume mount, um, you can access them on your local machine as well, which is super useful, much like the environment variables. Right, let's just check where we're at here. If I just do a list and I'll, um, yeah, I'll close that one down. I think I've already typed that. Leave the data pressing node service. Looks good. Right. The next thing I want to show you, so up until this point, we've just been using Telepresence uh, standalone OSS tool. You can go along to um, the URLs in the slide deck, but you can go along, download it, start playing around. We do connect it up to our SaaS product and you can use it up to, uh, is, is sort of no limit to signing in. Um, you can intercept five services with preview URLs. So community edition, no credit card required. You have to log in by GitHub, which I'll show you in a second. But if you do do this, connect Telepresence to the cloud, you get a whole bunch of other cool tools to play with. So I'll do Telepresence login just to show you the flow. I'll log in via GitHub here. This is just our, our SaaS app, Ambassador Cloud. And I'll load up DataWire as my org. If I see all my teammates have been doing lots of intercepts today. Yes, yeah, so you get a view onto intercepts uh, that you've got on your um, CLI, you can actually manage them like via this UI here too. But the real magic now, once I've done that login, if I now do a telepresence intercept, as we did before, if I step back on my data processing service, I'll hit enter. It's asking me some additional detail about my ingress. And this is all to do with how we set up what's called preview URLs. And I'll, I'll step through this, the defaults actually are gonna work for me. So I'll just literally press enter. Uh, this is basically configuring behind the scenes a separate preview URL, which I can then share, which will show the changes I, I'm making locally in isolation and without changing what's going on when folks are hitting via the normal ingress. So basically, I could share with you this preview URL we'll generate in just a moment. You and I could be coding, we could be pairing, and you'll see my changes I'm making locally, but folks accessing the normal ingress will not see our changes. This is super interesting. We've got a set up here, looks good to me. So if I, I've got my um, preview URL here, if I copy that one, pop it into my browser, hit return, it's triggered my breakpoint, that's good. I'll get rid of that breakpoint, I'll pass it through. So we know that preview URL is hitting my local machine. So I'm going in through here, hitting my local machine on the laptop, calling out, Pretend data back, looks good. We've got a banner down here actually saying, oh, you're viewing a telepresence preview. But if I hit my normal ingress, refresh, nothing. No telepresence banner and you're seeing the green and the original data. So now anyone who's accessed that preview URL, and by default, we limit it to your GitHub organization, hence the login. So 
uh, anyone who's in the data wire organization, that was what our company used to be called before we've changed to Ambassador Labs, but anyone who's in the data wire organization who logs in to the Ambassador Cloud after, they've, uh, after I've given them the preview URL can now see me working in isolation. So imagine I'm sharing this preview URL with folks, we're, you know, we're coding, we're fixing stuff, and when we're happy, we then commit that code and push it down the pipeline. But all the while, all the other developers working in this, you know, say this is staging or dev or even prod, they're completely unaffected by, by us because the proxy, the smart proxy that we're putting in front of the data processing service is just passing through normal traffic. But when there's a header passed down the stack with the preview URL that does it automatically, then it's routing to my local machine. And there is a, a bit of magic, of course, needed. Like the very large Java service and the ingress must propagate the header. So if you actually look back in the terminal, you can see here there's a the header set, x telepresence intercept ID, and a UID here and some details. Um, you need to propagate that header down the stack. Um, and just to, um, if actually, if I just, just to prove this is like simple header stuff, if I just take this here, this is my normal ingress, right? I'm hitting at the, hitting my normal ingress. If I, um, I've got like a, a very simple way here of just setting a, a header. If I put my X telepresence intercept ID in, in down here, put my UID and details in here. Uh, oops, I've messed up. So actually that, the header goes there. I need the name of the URL, actual URL. So if I put the URL in here, uh, add it, looks good. So I've set basically on this URL now, I'm, I'm always going to, my browser is always going to inject X telepresence intercept ID with this header value. So if I actually go back to my main ingress now and hit refresh, I'm going to see the orange, yeah. With the preview URL, we set up behind the scenes that injection of the um, the, uh, the header automatically. You still need your apps to propagate the header down through the stack, though. And my very large Java service, I think I've got it down here. It's a Spring Boot app, and I have used. If we bring up Maven. I have used something called um, Spring Cloud Sleuth, Spring Cloud Starter Sleuth. It's actually a distributed tracing. Uh, library framework. Uh, if you're using things like Zipkin, Jaeger, Lightstep, all that good stuff for um, building a graph for your services and, and doing observability, with Spring Cloud Sleuth, it adds in the ability to propagate headers down the stack. And it's super simple to add additional, uh, they call them baggage, but additional headers in the application properties. You can literally see here, if I move my Slack out of the way, my Zoom out of the way, I've added in additional um, baggage remote field. I'm saying propagate all my telepresence uh, intercept IDs down the stack. So the preview URL or my browser, when I set up the example here, is uh, hitting the ingress, the ingress ambassador in my case, is forwarding the, head, the header down, very large Java service, forwarding the header down. And the proxy that's running here is making a decision. If the header's set and it's good, route it to my local machine. If it's not set, route it through to the normal um, the normal uh, service running in the cluster. So you can kind of like get this almost like personal space going on, or or, or you can either like just do it personally, or you can share the headers with other folks, and you can all collaborate around these things. With and um, the pre, if I go back to the um, refresh here with the preview URL, if I what's it called? It's a very strange name, and if I just copy that and search for it in my uh, web here. If I now um, make this publicly accessible, I don't know if I can paste it into Slack, uh, into Zoom here, um, chat. If I just pop it in, if folks do want to have a look. Oh, it didn't work. Um, one second. Copy. Put in there. Um, you should be able to access that. You will need to log in just to like because uh, basically it shows up who's accessed what. But because you even if you're not in the data wire organization, which I'm guessing you aren't, <laughs> uh, you will still be able to now hit that endpoint. So if you hit that endpoint and log in with your GitHub account or your GitLab account, for example, and we probably should see uh, IntelliJ um, popping up over here, or you should be able to. I've removed the breakpoints, haven't I? We're good. Yeah. So if we just bring up the console. Like uh, folks are going to hit that endpoint, you should be able to see now uh, some some debug information going up. Like if I hit refresh, I should be writing my local machine there, which I think is good. Uh, cool, right? That's sort of um. I think that's the main thing I wanted to show you all in terms of the demo. I, I made some notes here just so I don't forget. Yep, looks good. Just to pop back to the terminal, 
I get rid of the chat there, clear my screen. If I just do k get pods, oops, that's not going to work. If I do k get pods, you can actually see in the data processing service the pod, the the, the second um, container now. So if I just do a k describe pod here, uh, you can scroll up a little bit. You can see I've got, in addition to my data processing service as a container, I've got this traffic agent, and that's the smart proxy, the Envoy proxy, doing the routing to my local machine based on the headers and so forth. So no real magic there, but just wanted to show you behind the scenes uh, uh, what's going on. Clear the screen again. And when I'm done, I can do telepresence, uninstall everything. This is sort of the nuclear option, but quite often I'll leave it running. But if you do telepresence, uninstall everything, it takes out the traffic manager from your um, cluster. And it also takes out the, the, um, the, uh, the sidecar as well. So you can see my pod with the extra sidecar is terminating and we're spinning up a, just a, a plain standard data processing service as well now. So that is the live demo. Let me pop back to Keynote. Hopefully I didn't go too fast for folks. I know it is quite a lot to take in. I've got some videos online where you can watch me at half speed, if that helps. <laughs> um, and there's also lots of documentation online um, where you can run through these things at your own pace. And I personally find that's the best way to, to learn. Here we go. We'll go back to the, well, the demo. So um, this is sort of behind the scenes of what's going on in terms of um, uh, preview URLs, personal intercepts. The magic is all about that sidecar, right? Putting that sidecar next to your um, Java service running in the cluster. We can do cool stuff based on that. We can make requests in. If we're putting injecting the headers or using preview URLs, we can make decisions on should we forward that onto the service running in the cluster or should we actually forward this onto my local laptop? Kind of very useful. Just a reference here for folks that will be downloading the slides afterwards. These are your main commands you're going to need. Telepresence connect, intercept, login, and then telepresence intercept too. And once you've logged in, you do get that ability. For five services, you get that ability to do the preview URLs. And I find these super useful when I'm pairing with some folks, and we don't want to impact everyone else in the cluster. So I'd love your feedback on that. Hopefully it's useful. Um, if you'd like some, you know, some tweaks to it, just, just let us know. Just sort of wrapping up a few things like there's you know the good bad and the don't try this at home with with telepresence right the benefits is that you can use any tool that runs on your laptop you don't need to build that container anymore you can hook up an ide a debugger a profiler anything you can run locally now can access the cluster can be called into can access the cluster i found this super useful for debugging weird dns things in kubernetes clusters and just for debugging like i showed you just a moment ago you can connect to cloud-based resources. Um, so there's, if you folks are familiar, there is an older version of Telepresence where it was an also proxy flag. We haven't got that full functionality in the new version of Telepresence that I've demoed here yet. Um, but if you're using external names in the Kubernetes cluster to reference, say, an Amazon RDS instance or a, a Kafka cluster, you can access that Kafka cluster, that RDS instance. Frequently, I'll, I'll find myself connecting into the Kubernetes clusters just to query a MySQL database. Yeah, I don't want to expose MySQL to the world. So once I'm telepresence uh, connected to the cluster, I can just you know, connect up like my uh, either command line or by my tools to hit up the, um, the, uh, the actual cluster name. So mysql.default3306, that kind of thing, super useful. Same network namespace, like I said, NS network lookup, sorry, NS lookup is a super useful tool if you're trying to figure out what's going on, how routing's happening. It's just really nice to my laptop to be in that cluster. And you get there very fast in a loop. That's the, that's the main pitch. If you're a developer and with Java with a compile type language, being able to like just iterate really fast and test things as, as your customers, as your users will see them, it's game changing, right? I remember when I first bumped into the first version of Telepresence five years ago, I guess now, I was like, this is just brilliant. You know, just as Kubernetes was becoming popular, um, and yeah, telepresence really changed the way I developed apps uh, against, against the cluster. The requirements. Now, obviously you do need a network connection. The beauty of running Minikube or K3S locally is you can kind of be on the train or well, not many of us can these days, but you know, if you're out and about, um, you, could, you can just use a local uh, Minikube or whatever, Docker desktop. If you're telepresencing, you do need that remote cluster. You can telepresence into a Minikube, sure, no problems. But we often find folks, the reason they're telepresencing is because they've got a big kind of cluster and that needs to run in GKE or Azure, for example. You need a good network connection. 
this new version of telepresence is more resilient of network failures. The old version of telepresence did actually used to break sometimes with spotty connections. This new version should be much more resilient thanks to the traffic manager running in the cluster. You do need kubectl access, the way we sort of bootstrap some of the tunnels and connections, it actually uses kubectl under the hood. So you need kubectl and you need RBAC access. And the docs go into all the details and for exactly what kind of uh, permissions RBAC you do need. If you, if you or your ops team want to know exactly what's going on, the docs do, do explain all that. Uh, it runs on Mac. Linux or WSL2. It doesn't run on Windows native uh, at the moment. Um, and WSL2, I think, has got a few quirks. So check out the docs. And, and we're always uh, up for feedback in our Slack. We've got a DataWire Ambassador Lab Slack where you can pop along and ask questions if you do get stuck. So I know some folks are running it successfully on WSL2, um, but the networking stack's a bit uh, different there compared to, say, some of the more uh, traditional networking stacks that we used in Linux and so forth. The don't try this at home thing, with the classic, when I used to present this at KubeCons, I've, I've gone to a few KubeCons, very lucky I've presented telepresence. People were like, you know, it's a classic hacker news thing. Like, why is telepresence so big? I could code this in the weekend. It's just a proxy. It's just Envoy in the cluster. And yeah, you're kind of right. <laughs> you, you could code this up in a weekend, right? But the challenge is, it's really hard to get it working. So I say, don't try this at home, like capturing DNS and routing selectively, like the team, the, the tech team behind it, like I'm the one talking about it, but I don't code on the actual tool that much. The, the team is fantastic. Thomas, Luke, Donnie, they're amazing folks and many other engineers. And um, they are real wizards with DNS, with tunneling, all this kind of stuff. So they've done the hard work, right? Maintaining proxy connections is really challenging. Well, I had a lot of fun in games this over the years. Again, Telepresence has done, got the hard work baked in. Lots of different Kubernetes resource types. Telepresence supports uh, intercepting uh, deployments, replica sets, and uh, stateful sets as well. And they're all subtly different about how you intercept them. So again, Telepresence has done the hard work, so you don't have to sort of bake that into your own homegrown solution. The last two ones are the real, really important ones. No two laptops are alike and no two clusters are alike. Laptops in particular, we are constantly, you know, identifying things where someone's got their laptop configured in a certain way that means telepresence doesn't work. And we're squashing all those issues as, as fast as we can. The community is contributing patches to do these things as well. And um, this is where I say don't try it at home because you really want to tap into the community wisdom. All the folks using the tool, all the folks working on the tool. It is a CNCF project. So we have fantastic amount of eyes looking on the project. We have folks doing docs, we have folks doing pull requests, you know, and, and just the sheer volume and size and different approaches, different clusters, different clouds, different configs. You know, I think rallying around an open source CNCF tool is the right approach to take. That's why we donated Ambassador to the CNCF, same kind of deal, right? We are really happy with the project, but we just want more people helping out, want more eyes on it, more contributions. So Telepresence was donated as a sandbox project about four years ago now, I think, quite quite a few years ago. Um, and it's been happily, you know, getting feedback. And then this latest version, Telepresence 2, was released, I think, about three months ago. And we're getting great feedback from the community already. Right. Let me um, quickly, I'm looking at time here. I'll just quickly run through some workflows, then I'll skip the end and we'll take some questions. So how I see folks using Telepresence, the first step is what I call the YOLO approach, right? It is, if you haven't got product market fit, you're a startup, right? You know, you can literally use telepresence in production. One production, you know, cluster, single source of truth. I, as a developer, check out my code. I telepresence in, I do my tests. Because if I've got no customers, who cares if I'm messing up production, right? <laughs> um, intercept service on demands using telepresence, using idea or VS code or whatever. Once the code is done, I'll push it down my you know, Jenkins pipeline or my Circle CI or, or Argo, whatever I'm using, uh, to actually deploy it. Now, Obviously, testing in production can be scary. As soon as you've got more than a handful of customers, you need to be a bit careful. Even if you're using preview URLs, uh, it's very easy to mess up data sometimes, right? If you're just one production cluster, preview URLs, if you're mutating state, that does not protect you. The, the, the end user won't see the, the changes because you've got your preview URL set up. But if you mess around with their data, they will see that. So often when I you know, chat to folks about testing in production, doing this YOLO workflow, this is the kind of response, yeah, particularly from managers where they say, you're testing in production, what? Uh, and I get it, right, I get it. When you got to the next step, you're maybe a small, medium enterprise, small, medium business, then you typically do this kind of dev cluster and, and you then do stuff in dev. And when it goes through to staging, maybe to prod, that kind of thing. You can check out one of your microservices. You'll typically coordinate with other developers if you're using telepresence. The things to watch out for is coupled service APIs. So say I'm working on a service, 
and you're checking out a service and working on it. We're both telepresencing into the, the cluster, working in isolation, sharing the cluster effectively, we're just working on our respective services. But if those services are coupled, you often run into the, the challenges. You know, you're changing the API, I'm not wearing, aware you're changing the API, you know, disaster ensues when we actually push the code to production. I've already mentioned about mutating shared state. I've personally done this and it's not a good look where I've been preview, you know, intercepting in uh, to the cluster, messing around with stuff. I've made a change, it's broke something, it's modified data in my database and that's broken someone else's test or something. And I'm like, oops, gotta be really careful when you're mutating shared state. Uh, the, the actual sort of workflow though is very similar to what I described with the YOLO workflow. You just kind of spin up your, you know, your services locally, you're testing in the cluster, the shared resources, doing your thing. And again, whatever I recommend, like telepresence doesn't give you that full fidelity because you're not packaging the app locally in a container. So you do want to use either something like scaffold as well as telepresence. We often use scaffold, uh, telepresence and scaffold. Telepresence for the fast feedback, hot reload, and scaffold for the auto building of the container in the background and pushing up to the cluster. Then you can test it in the cluster. But whatever you do, you definitely want to push your code down a pipeline where it gets packaged into a container, tested, deployed into staging, these kind of things. Telepresence isn't the shortcut for you know, running your app full time, for example. Fantastic talk, DevOps, so a couple of years ago now, I guess, by Cesar, well known in the, in the London tech scene. He may even be on the, on the Zoom here. Um, Cesar always has fantastic talks. He talked about how he'd use Telepresence. This is the original version of Telepresence, but it's a great talk. If you want to know more, check out Cesar's video there. It's awesome. If you want to go advanced workflow, there was a great talk at KubeCon 2018, I want to say, 2019, by Engel and Volkers. Um, they were using, again, Telepresence 1, but they were doing very advanced workflows with, um, they were using Basil or Basil, depending on how you pronounce it, the, the Google build tool, um, to do some really cool workflows. So they, they were actually using multiple namespaces, I think, for each, like each developer had a namespace. Um, shared cluster, each developer had a namespace. They were doing some really cool things where they were checking out the microservice, but using Basil or Basil <laughs> telepresence and their IDE to kind of connect in because the old telepresence had what's called a container mode where you could actually um, run everything locally in a container and proxy into your cluster. You can sort of still do that now. You could just spin up a you know, Docker runner container and, and do that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, I'm not going to do it justice. Like I, I sat to Christ, I, Christian, I, I watched his talk and I was like, whoa, that's such a cool use case. The video is online. You can check out more if you want to know. Um, it's great when you release tools into the wild, like the, the Master Labs team have done. Um, just seeing how people use them is just always a learning journey for us, which is just fantastic. Right, I'm actually going to skip over these slides here now. Um, let me just see if I can... I'll drop back here because I want to take some, want to leave some time for questions. So there were more big picture slides. I'll share them with you later so you can see what I was thinking on the bigger picture. But the conclusion is that the inner dev loop can be painful if you're running Java microservices and deploying onto Kubernetes. You can often start small with your Minikube, but once you get a certain number of services, you can't run them all locally, and then the dev loop starts slowing down. So that's when telepresence, scaffold, all these tools are fantastic. Telepresence in particular is really good for proxying your machine into the cluster. Super fast feedback loops, no need to sort of build images in the background and push up. You can literally, like I showed you, you can live code, you can debug as if you were in the cluster. Really useful. Support several workflows. You can go from sort of like the YOLO thing. You can go all the way through to the advanced use cases. You can use preview URLs to share your work. You can do personal intercepts where you just create that header like I showed you, and only you know the header token. So only you see your changes. No one else is aware of what you're, what you're coding on. Um, it's really flexible. I'm sure you'll find more use cases that I've not even thought of. So Telepresence is one of those Swiss Army knife type tools. Um, and the community have just, yeah, have, have come along and invented many different patterns. And finally, it is CNCF project. So the CNCF is just a fantastic community. If you have not familiar with them, they're awesome. They kind of look after Kubernetes. They look after a bunch of different tools. You know, we've contributed Telepresence and Emissary Ingress Ambassador. There's a Linkerd for Service Mesh. There's Prometheus in there. And the beauty of this kind of th this community is that it's a shared place to collaborate. Not only code, but you know, KubeCons. You can sort of like they're virtual, of course, at the moment. But you can go along. You can chat to folks. You can learn. I love the CNCF community. And it's just a great way. If you're looking to get started, you can help with docs. If you're a bit more advanced, you can do some code stuff. 
or you can do some like set up some tests or something you know whatever you you want to do like telepresence i think is a, is a great place to to get started as well there's lots of questions in the in our slack that you can help answer for example and um, we love folks to get involved please please do this kind of brings me on to contributing documentation workflows like honestly documentation is like gold these days uh, the engineers like in many of us don't like writing docs but docs are really valuable so please you know like i thoroughly encourage you to write docs it's something i try and do a lot more these days you can explain how you integrate telepresence into your dev workflow and um, let us know if you're a user that is super useful we found out you know big companies are using telepresence and it just adds credence and and just helps us get the word out there so let us know if you're a user you can triage bugs. We use GitHub for our support. Um, it doesn't always scale well, so you know, you get involved in, in helping out there. You can jump on our Slack. There's a link here, and we've got a dedicated telepresence channel. Free to join and pop along, have a chat there. Love to see you there, and, and you'll find me under Daniel Bryant UK there as well. And at that point, a bunch of links for you. Here's where you can download telepresence. Uh, here's my blog post that goes into all the stuff I kind of showed you today around how to set up Spring Boot apps and, and debug code repos there for you. I'm running some office hours. Myself and my colleague Peter are doing a bit more of a deep dive into diagnosing and debugging on Kubernetes tomorrow. Um, next week, I'm doing sort of a mini rerun of this talk, but with some more ask me anything, more, more questions as well. So love to see you along. It's a Zoom chat. Just pop along. You know, it's a free form kind of uh, chat. Um, love to see folks there. I think finally, you can hit me up at db at datawire.com on the interwebs on Twitter in particular at Daniel Bryant UK. Love to get involved with Twitter. Love to get involved with the DMs. And thanks for your time. All right, uh, we do have some questions in the chat window. Oh, good stuff. Uh, yeah, obviously. Uh, the first question is from Timo Ve Timo Volkov. I hope you're okay. Uh, which is how uh, do I install Telepresence? Do I need to manually run it as a sidecar in my cluster? So in to install Telepresence, uh, have I messed up? Well, I think I've messed up my links. Just follow this link. There we go. Follow this link here. Um, that's the best way. So you install it as a binary. So you literally, like, if you're on Mac, just download a binary. Actually, all, all the distros now, Mac, um, Linux, uh, and uh, Windows, WSO2. Um, uh, one caveat, please don't use brew install. We haven't actually, if, you, if you're on Mac and using brew or something like that, we haven't updated brew yet. It still points to the old version of Telepresence. So pop along to the website. Um, there's all the instructions there, simple curl, um, you need to um, make sure you set it to executable permissions, but we, we talk about that in the docs. And when you first start Telepresence, it will look for your kube um, config to which cluster to connect to. It'll ask for a pseudo password because it does IP tables on your local machine and it'll connect into your cluster. So managing the sidecars, managing the traffic manager in the cluster, Telepresence does all that for you. So all you need as a developer to do is download the binary, get it working, uh, follow the quick start is my recommendation. The quick start is um, actually so you can find it on that page um, or look at my um, tutorial here. That'll get you up and running with the basic premise and then you can expand it to your services. Okay, we've got a question from Tim. He's asking whether uh, your, whether your, uh, does your laptop effectively run on the same namespace as the service you're interested in? Uh, oh, great question. Great question. So when I do the telepresence connect, it's like I'm free floating in the cluster. So I have to specify the um, namespace. So if you saw when I was doing that curl earlier on, I, like, I did a telepresence connect and I did curl uh, data processing service dot default. Now, as soon as I do an intercept, that namespace is implied. So if I do an intercept data processing node service and it's in my default namespace, I no longer need to do um, add the dot default when I'm curling into other things. So the docs go into more details of exactly how that works. Even if you've intercepted into one namespace, one service, you can still access the other services just by doing the dot um, uh, name, namespace afterwards. So if I'm in the default namespace, for example, and I want to do a curl to ambassador and ambassador namespace, I can still do curl ambassador dot ambassador port number yeah, 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 that kind of thing. So it, the, the only thing I would say is one thing that caught me a little bit initially is when you just do a telepresence connect, the behavior is a bit different because you're free floating across all the namespaces. You need to specify your namespace. As soon as you do an intercept, then you are sort of tied to that namespace. And if you want to access other things outside the namespace, you have to explicitly specify your namespace. 
Okay, we've got another question from June, which is uh, how could we address some of the security concerns for a company to implement uh, this and give uh, this option to developers? Oh, um, great question. So that's probably, you know, jump on the Slack and ask us, because we've had a bunch of folks that are, you know, worried about the RBAC permissions. We've actually documented what RBAC position permissions we need now on, on the docs. So that's something you can give to your security team and say, hey, look, this is the permissions. Um, if you can coop cuttle and do stuff in your cluster, telepresence doesn't sort of add much extra risk, I guess. Um, but it is, it, I mean, I, I, I've got to always be quite careful saying that because every company quite rightly has their own torrents of risk. So, you know, jump on the Slack, ask us questions by all means. If the docs don't go into enough detail on permissions, we can sort of run you through how some of the things work. Under the hood is a lot of, you know, SSH um, tunnels and there's some WebSockets involved as well, but it's all over TLS, for example. So um, in general, we've not had too many folks, once we sort of explain some of the details behind the scenes, folks are like, oh yeah, that seems very reasonable long as there's precautions in the way you um, uh, limit permissions to namespaces and, and the cluster in general, you should be good to go. But I, I like to say it's kind of, you know, it's often every security team has different requirements, different questions. So just, just hit us up on the Slack. Okay, cool. Uh, we've got a question from Will. Uh, he's asking if, uh, if uh, telepresence is not coupled uh, to job in any way, for example, if, uh, if you have a cluster uh, containing uh, .NET services, uh, could we use telepresence in the way you have described today? Yeah, that's a perfect question. Thank you, Will. You've actually like, yes, I should have said that for sure. Telepresence is not language specific. So the original version of telepresence was written in Python. This new version I demo today is actually written in Go. So the, the telepresence itself, because a lot of cloud native stuff is written in Go these days, but, the, but it's completely language agnostic of how you use it. So I demoed, um, go if you pop along to our website we've actually got tutorials in sorry i demo java um if you pop along to our uh, tutorial website we've got demos in node java go two flavors of python i think and um, we haven't got dotnet demos but that's only because we haven't created them yet so dotnet no problem at all providing you're using an http uh, uh, transport layer so, so to speak and um, you're good to go for intercept so you can intercept um http uh, grpc a lot of other protocols um in terms of like uh, accessing into the cluster it's just tcp so you can intercept http grpc all that good stuff um, but you can actually reach into the cluster for over the mysql protocol kafka protocol tcp protocol whatever kind of thing so intercepts are, are a bit more limited but the actual reaching into the cluster is is, is not limited and and that same thing with the languages right whether you're running dotnet or java same deal you could just route from the remote cluster to your local machine and you'll be running you know the, the dotnet version of intellij effectively okay cool uh, we've got a question from uh, kunar tisu tanto uh, he's asking whether uh, he can use the telepresence to debug on openshift Oh yeah, you certainly can. These, these questions are great. I know all the things I should have mentioned you're covering. Uh, yeah, so there's a demo actually. Um, Ara Polito from Datadog and I did a webinar with DevOps.com. So if you search for Telepresence OpenShift, um, you should find it. I think it was oh, a few months ago now. We actually did it for the um, London Blueprint Conference recently as well. So um, you can find Ara and myself talking about this. We were using uh, OpenShift and we were using, um, actually, yeah, sorry, only the DevOps.com webinar we were using OpenShift and we were using their code ready containers uh, to run stuff locally and use Telepresence to proxy in and, and test. So yes, tele, uh, OpenShift, fantastic bit of kit. For folks that are not aware, it's kind of adds a few abstraction layers on top of Kubernetes, but it's fundamentally Kubernetes under the hood. So Telepresence works fine with it, as far as I know. And if it doesn't, let me know. Okay, cool. Last but not least, we've got a question from Alexander. Uh, He's asking whether there are any issues with other CNIs like uh, AWS uh, VPC networking on uh, eGuys. Oh, great question. So folks who are not familiar, it's a CNI, the container native interface. Um, oh, that's a good question. So we've tested it on a bunch of different CNI implementations, all the clouds we regularly test on, and it works well. So folks often ask me about, does it work with Istio? Does it work with the service mesh? And we're work and I believe it does. And we're improving that even more now. Just yesterday, I think it was, we dropped Telepresence 2.1.5, which added MTLS connections. So if you're using um, 
like Istio as a service mesh and you're doing MTLS, mutual TLS, mutual encryption uh, in your cluster, we now support that. That's a, a brand new feature that was released earlier in the week. Um, the honest answer is with all these things, like I hinted at in the, you know, don't build it at home yourself. There is so many variations of CNI plugins, of service meshes, of gateways that we really encourage folks to try it. If it doesn't work, raise an issue in GitHub or ping us on Slack and we'll have a look in, into you, in for you. And again, it's a community project, so we can't guarantee we'll fix everything because you know we, we welcome pull requests. We welcome folks to sort of help us fix things. We're somewhat, we're a startup, we're somewhat limited in, in our um, ability, but we really appreciate the heads up. If, if a CNI plugin or a service mesh doesn't work, let us know. And we love all the service meshes. I, I've got to shout out the LinkedIn folks, regularly work with them. I've got to shout out HashiCorp folks with console, regularly work with them too. I haven't tested Telepresence with that stuff recently, but um, but loving all their work and, and the goal would be for Telepresence to work with that too. Well, brilliant, lovely talk. I'd like to thank Daniel for being with us today. And, uh, and please note that the video recording will be on YouTube. Uh, well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thanks, Hamza. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you.